So we now continue. So, uh, is the process of context switching clear to everyone? So the main mechanism is the trap instruction for context switching. Uh, when we say context, when we say context, we refer to the state of the process. So process A, for example, process A, when it performs a system, when it when it, it calls a system call, the mode of the operate, the mode of the processor will move from user mode to kernel mode. Right? What happens during this uh, switch? Right? Now, if you're going to look at it, uh, system call is very similar to an ordinary function call. Remember, when you have a function call, you have a, uh, in an ordinary function call in the process, uh, you have a stack frame, right? So it uses the stack or it pushes the parameters of the stack, okay? So that's why in the context switch, for example, this is process one, okay? Process one has its own stack, right? This is called the process stack, right? However, However, when the process switches to the kernel mode, when it issues a syscall, okay, it also uses a different, so this is called the user stack, and this one is the kernel stack. Okay. So when you issue a system call, what happens is the context of the process is saved to the kernel stack, then, when it returns back, okay, that is, uh, it's an IREC, for example, okay, it can go back to the original process. You get the idea? So always remember that when you have a process, okay, uh, it uses uh, both a kernel stack and uh, the user stack. So perhaps, uh, Okay, so let's uh, review this. So, the scheduler, which is the next chapter that we're going to talk about, will be involved in selecting the process to switch. Okay, so normally uh, the, ske the scheduler has something to do with the policy, selecting which process to run on the CPU, whereas the context switch is what for the mechanism. How? Policy, okay. mechanism is more on how policy is for which one. Right? So if you have a lot of processes running on a single CPU, it's the scheduler who decides uh, which will run, which we'll discuss later, the decision to do that. Okay? So the context switch, as I said, is this one. Okay? So you have this uh, information. So you have to save that on the uh, kernel stack, the registers, okay, the context for the counter, kernel stack pointer when it goes back. Okay. So I think this is the flow flow chart for the for that. Okay. So when the operating system boots up, okay, as you can see there, it initializes a trap table. You did not do this in the bootloader example. But in other operating systems, in ICS OS, we're going to look at the code, how this is done, initializing the interrupt. In the x86, it's called the interrupt vector table or interrupt descriptor table. Okay? And then the hardware, so it's basically you put in the uh, addresses. Whenever an interrupt number uh, ha is triggered, it will jump to the syscall handler, handler and then execute that. Okay? So it can be a syscall handler, let's say int 80H for Linux, or let's say one interrupt 1C for the timer handler. Okay? Then once it's set, it will install, start now the interrupt timer. So this is non-cooperative, okay? Non-cooperative. So it will start a timer, and then in the OS, and then the hardware will the hardware timer will start ticking. Okay, let's say 20, let's say you say specify 100, every 100, 100, Milliseconds, the interrupt hunger 
clock, the timer handler will be uh, called. Okay? So you interrupt the CPU in uh, X, say 100 milliseconds. Okay? And then uh, you have uh, process A here. So it's assuming that uh, the kernel mode has, the kernel has selected a process to run on the CPU. So in this example, you have process A here. Okay? And then after some time, the timer elapsed. Okay? So what happens? Okay? So process A is running, it's doing its job. Then suddenly, the timer interrupts. Okay? So what will happen? Okay? That becomes, this is, these are the things that will happen in the hardware done by the x86 stack, task state segment. Okay? So you save the registers of A to the kernel stack of A, move to the kernel mode, and jump to the trap handler. So these are the steps that happens when the interrupt timer is triggered. Okay. So parang alarm clock yan. Okay. Or actually yung, uh, yung countdown timer sa sa okay. So kung nag-ilapse yung after 2 uh, 100 milliseconds, ito yung mangyayari. Okay. So remember, so you save the registers of A to the kernel stack of A, okay. and then move to the kernel mode, okay. and ito na yung ginagawa ng kernel mode. Ito na yung Okay, you get the idea? Okay. And after that, okay, so, so ang nangyari, uh, ano yung timer, halimbawa, may ginagawa ko, kahit wala siyang system call, ito, pinapakita natin dito, meron siyang system call na nangyari. Pero ito, kahit wala siyang ginagawa ng system call, na-trigger lang yung interrupt timer, okay, pupunta na siya agad dito. Okay, you get the idea? So there are two options, two ways kung paano siya pupunta dito sa, ano, sa, sa kernel mode. One is, pag nag-syscall siya, another one is pag nag-time out na yung interrupt timer. Okay? In that way, para makuha ng operating system yung control. Okay? Para bumalik sa kanya. Kasi ang assumption natin, non-cooperative. Okay? So this will happen now. Uh, it calls the switch routine. Okay? Uh, save uh, registers A to... Proc, uh, proc struct A and then and then return from trap and then process B na ngayon nangyari. So, this is basically what happened. Ito yung tanong kanina na if you have if you are in the kernel mode okay, itinan mo ngayon dilipad ka ba sa ibang process? So, this is how it's done. Okay. And basically ang, ang minamalito na ito dyan ay yung uh, kernel stack. Right. The kernel stack, you manipulate the kernel stack. Okay? So, when it comes to context switching, this is the code for the XB6. Okay. So, ito na. Sinisave ko lang yung mga important registers to ito yung stack mo. Okay. So, uh, lalagay mo lang yun dyan. So, notice na dito, sinave mo yung stack para nag-allocate ka ng space para sa stack and then you place all the important registers dun sa stack na yun, okay? And then you move on to the, ito yung bagong, bagong context, right? Assuming na nandito yung, ano, yung uh, process B, okay? Delete ang muna lang sa loob, and then you perform, okay? Okay? You get the idea? So, yun lang, pinapalit-palit mo lang. Kasi, always remember that the state of the process, kung ano yung ginagawa ng process, is stored in the registers, okay? So, that's basically that. Okay, so concurrency, uh, what happens if during interrupt or trap handling another interrupt occurs? So, halimbawa, uh, nag-syscall siya. Okay? Nag-syscall siya, tapos, yun na dito na siya. And then, nagkaroon ng timer, nag-trigger yung timer interrupt. Okay? Or, merong ibang process na nag-trigger din ng interrupt. Okay? So, that is a problem. Yun yung problem ng concurrency. Okay? So, what will happen is uh, paano i-handle na yun ng operating system? Okay? So, one way to do that is uh, disable interrupt. So, halimbawa, may, may minap yung operating system kernel, may minamanipulate na link list, may minu-update sa dyan. Tapos maraming nag access dyan na, uh, na processes. Okay? So, Whenever this, uh, whenever those accesses will require concurrent access to a uh, shared data structure happens, you can disable the interrupts. Sa ano sa x86, uh, 
we have an instruction called CLI, Clear Interrupt. So, kung halimbawa, gagalawin mo yung link list. Halimbawa, ito yung ready view mo. Okay? Mag-add ka ng bagong process dun sa ready queue. Okay? Bago mo gawin yun, you can clear the interrupt first para wala siyang marireceive na interrupt. Kasi halimbawa, ina-adjust mo yung pointer. Biglang nagkaroon ng timer interrupt. Diba? Di, hindi mo pa na-update yung pointer di dangling pointer na yun. Nag-press na agad yung, ano, yung system mo nun. Diba? Kasi nag-switch ka na agad eh. Okay? So, it's very important the one way to do that is perform a clear interrupt, do the operation, and then, after that, enable the interrupt. STI. Okay? STI is the instruction to enable the interrupt again in the x86. Okay? So, in a way, kumbaga, exclude kung baka hindi mai-interrupt yung pag paggalaw mo nitong data structure na to. Okay, get the idea? Okay. However, this one is expensive. Okay? Kasi pag clean pag clean mo, ang mangyayari wala talaga siyang matanggap na interrupt. Paano pag importante yung interrupt? Na mismo siya, di ba? So sometimes this is not the most effective way of handling an currency. Meron pinatawag na locking mechanisms which we'll discuss later about uh, let's say for example you have the exchange uh, swap uh, compare and swap okay instructions meron mga ganung instructions sa x86 na atomic siya na hindi mo pwedeng i-interrupt pero one way to do this is this one but this is quite uh, in inefficient and sometimes it may not be most effective kasi pag cleaner mo yung interrupt you will might you might miss some important interrupts okay so that's the idea so that's the end of uh, the execution, okay? So the main takeaway in that chapter is basically uh, to allow for the operating system to allow the user processes to do whatever they want on the CPU, but in a controlled manner. To gain control, you have the timer interrupt. This is the, the most common mechanism. So that whenever something bad happens, or for example, uh, a process, parang hindi niya pwedeng bakawin yung CPU. Ako na lang nagamit nito. mag infinite loop ako dito. Okay? Kasi uh, uh, at some point, pag nag-expire yung timer, nakukuha ulit ng kont yung control ng operating system. Okay? Good idea? Okay. So, we now move on to the next part. So, we, we're done with the context switch. How the process is switched from one process to another. How the CPU is switched from one process to another. Ang key takeaway that is you have the user stack and the kernel stack. Okay? Pag nasa kernel mode ka, yung state ng computation ay nasa kernel stack. Okay? Tapos, parang balik mo, pwede mo, mo, mo balikan niya. So, you have a per process stack on the kernel. Per process kernel stack for each process. Okay? So we now move on to the scheduler. Okay? So the scheduler is important because it selects, it selects, it selects, okay, you have a list of processes here, and you only have one CPU here. Okay? Which among these processes are you going to place on the CPU? What are the criteria that you need to consider? Okay? So before we do that, for this chapter, we have to make some assumptions regarding the processes. In the old days, it's called jobs. Okay. What are these, why are these assumptions important? Because they will define or somehow affect the different policies, these different scheduling policies. So there are four assumptions, and as we go along in the, chap the chapter, we're going to relax some of these assumptions in order to uh, satisfy certain uh, uh, metrics. Okay? So the first assumption is that each job runs for the same amount of time. Okay? So that's one assumption. Uh, we're actually interested in, when you say amount of time, how long does it take for a job to finish? So the first assumption is say uh, 10 milliseconds, uh, 10, 10 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, A, B, C. So these are the jobs. Okay? All jobs arrive at the same time. So you're going to draw a timeline at time zero, all of these jobs will arrive to the operating system. Of course, at this point, you, you have one, you, you, you have the kernel here, right? 
So you, this is the GUT process. The kernel should be running on the CPU at some point, and then when a process arrives, uh, this list is managed by the kernel, the OS kernel, okay? So all jobs arrive at the same time. So for example, the kernel is running, and then it receives three jobs, A, B, C. They arrive at the same time, time zero, okay? Uh, all jobs only use the CPU. Okay? So the third assumption is uh, they did not per perform any input output operation, only uses the CPU. No, this is the I.O. Okay? They don't access the disk. Okay? And the runtime of each uh, job is known. Okay? So uh, you know, there is a knowledge. We all know that task A is 10 milliseconds, task B is 10 milliseconds, task C is 10 milliseconds. But however, in reality, we don't actually know that. We don't know how long Firefox is running, will be running. We don't know how LibreOffice will be running, right? Okay. But for the discussion of the scheduling policy, right now I'm running Libre uh, events, PDF viewer. I don't. Uh, I don't know how long uh, this process will run, okay? but in the context of this uh, chapter, there is an assumption that we know, for example, events will run 10 milliseconds. Okay? So let's move on to the first, uh, let's, let's move on to the metrics. Okay? If you're uh, taking COMSI 132, then you have uh, throughput and response time as the main metrics when designing uh, about programs. So the same did, same did naman dito, right? So there are, uh, the, first perform the first metric is performance, okay? So performance metric, and the first uh, metric is called turnaround time, okay? Uh, what is turnaround time? It's the time at which the job completes minus the time at which the job arrived in the system, okay? In our assumption, we have these three processes, and then they all arrive at time zero, then that would be the time arrival, okay? And the formula is simple. Turnaround time completion minus the time of arrival, okay? Another uh, metric is fairness, okay? So, we're going to talk about turnaround time in the next slides, but another uh, uh, metric is called fairness. You want to be able to uh, be fair to all of these processes. You should be given a chance to use the CPU. Right? But for now, we focus on the performance. Right? And uh, our main metric is turnaround time. Actually, we are, we are considering what we call the average turnaround time. When you say average turnaround time, for each process you have each uh, turnaround time because it's completion minus arrival. And for a given set of processes, if you average them, that is the average turnaround time. Okay? So the first uh, scheduling, scheduling policy that we're going to look into is very simple. First come, first serve, or first in, first out. Okay? So it's very simple and easy to implement. In the previous uh, offering of ComSci 125, you are asked to implement by programming, by simulating this in uh, a C program, right? But perhaps we will not do that this sem because uh, we're doing some experiments, right? Okay, so what, what does, how does this work, right? So A arrived just before B, which arrived just before C. So Assuming in our assumption that all of the jobs arrive at the same time, okay? so even though they arrive at the same time, there is always a chance na merong nauuna dyan. Diba? So pwede 0, 1, 2. Habihin natin na sabay-sabay nilang sinabmit sa, ano, sinabmit sa operating system. Pero pag nilagay yan dun sa queue, syempre merong nauuna yan. Hindi naman yung pwede pag ganun-ganun lahat, di ba? So, meron pa ako na dyan. Kahit sabihin na sinabit niya yan at time zero, yung, yung kernel, pwede add node 1, add node 2, add node 3. You get the idea? So, may mga una yan. And, if each of these processes 
consumes, let's say, 10 seconds na lang, then this will be the uh, diagram that illustrates the completion of all the tasks. So remember that our analysis will be based on a given set of processes. Okay? On a given set of processes. So here we have three processes. Okay? So what will happen? So 0, 10, 20, 30. So all in all, it will take uh, 30, uh, 30 seconds for everything to complete. Now we are going to measure the average turnaround time. For process A, what is the turnaround time for process A? That will be 10 minus 0. Kasi this is the thing that happens in A, di ba? So that will be 10. Do you agree? Okay. Uh, how about process B? Natapos siya 20. Pero nag-arrive siya 0. So 20 minus 0, 20. And then lastly, we have 30 minus 0. So we have 20 seconds as the average turnaround time. Get the idea? So for the set of processes, it will take 20 seconds for everything to complete uh, in average turnaround time. Right? Now, let's say uh, why FIFO is not, is, not, is not that great because it suffers from the convoy effect. What is this convoy effect? Right? So the problem is with the first come first serve is if the first job A, for example, eats up a lot of time. Right? And let's say, for example, uh, each job no longer runs for the same amount of time. So basically, this is our assumption, first assumption. Each job runs for the same amount of time. If we relax that, because naturally, hindi naman pare-pareho yung ano eh, yung time, di ba, ng bawat task. So, pwede magkaiba. So, if we relax the assumption, A arrived just before B, which arrived just before C, okay, A runs for 100 seconds, so, ito ngayon yung magiging, ang tawag dito is schedule, right? Because we are using schedule, so it's the schedule. Paano may schedule, right? So, kung ipang si A, what is the average uh, what's the turnaround time for A? Mahaba siya, di ba? So, 100 minus 0, so that will be 100. Si B, 110 minus 0, 110, and then C, that will be 120 minus 0. And what happens? What did, what, did you, what did you get? 110 seconds, which is way longer than this 20 seconds. Right? Of course, we, we relax the assumption that they have the same uh, completion time. Okay? Get the idea? And this is the scenario that will happen if you use FCFS and at the start you have very long tasks. Okay? So, a solution then is, okay, uh, this is FCFS, uh, FIFO with the, the convoy effect. Maybe, maybe, we can actually rearrange instead of just putting them in the ready queue in the order that they arrive. We have a knowledge of their, we have a knowledge of the runtime. Okay? We can perform a shortest job first. Let's run the shortest job jobs first. Okay? So we simply rearrange. So it's called a run job first, then the next one, and so on. It's a non-preemptive scheduler. What do you mean when you say non-preemptive scheduler? When you say non-preemptive scheduler, it means that you do not interrupt the process until it has completed its required time. Okay? That's non-preemptive. Bawal mo siyang interrupt. Pag nakasalang na si B, hindi mo pwedeng singitan yan. Hihintayin mo na matapos si B. That's called non-preemptive. Right? Now, if we have a non-preemptive SJF, this will be the schedule. Right? So B, let's look at the average turnaround time. B, 10 minus 0, 10. 20 minus 0, 20. And then 120 minus 0, 120. So you have 50 seconds. So that means that this is better 
than if we use FCFS because here you have the average turnaround time of 110 seconds. This one only 50 seconds. You get the idea? But the requirement is it is non preemptive. You cannot interrupt the process while it is running. Okay? You follow? Okay. Now, uh, uh, let's relax assumption number two, which means uh, that the jobs can arrive at any time. Okay? Uh, dito, ang assumption is all jobs arrive at the same time. Now, let's relax that with jobs can arrive at any time. So, we now change the scenario. A arrives at time T0, right? And T needs to run for 100 seconds, right? B and C arrive at time 10, and each need to run for 10 seconds. So, given na non-preemptive siya, bawal mo siyang singitan, at time 0, Since na ako si A, siya yung mag-run, di ba? Arrive the time. Tapos, dumating si B sa kasi C. Okay? Kaya dahil niya, at time T, B and C arrive dito. Kaso, non-preemptive siya. Kahit dumating sila ng maaga, hindi, uh, dumating sila at time dito, since nag-run na si A, hindi mo siya pwede i-interrupt. Hihintay nung matapos siya. You get the idea? And this will be the resulting Uh, this should be the resulting average start around time. So, siyempre, 100 CA, and then CB, that will be uh, 110 minus 10, and then CC, 120 minus 10, that will give you 103.33 seconds. Do you get the idea? So, what does that mean? Okay? If we relax assumption 2, then we have a higher uh, average certain around time. This might, not, this might not be good, right? Relaxing assumption two is somehow natural because not all jobs will arrive at the same time. Some jobs will arrive late, some jobs will arrive early, right? So it's good, it's better that if we relax, if we relax that assumption. However, the problem is this is what happens because of non-preemptive. Okay? Non-preemptive. So, the next solution is, of course, why don't we introduce preemption? Meaning, even though uh, some process is running on the CPU and then a new process comes, arrives, but let's say it has uh, shortest uh, remaining time first, okay? Less, uh, has the least time left, okay, maybe we can improve on the non-preemptive shortest job. So we now have a preemptive uh, short, shortest job first, uh, which is called shortest time to completion first or shortest time remaining first, uh, shortest time remaining, shortest remaining time first, SRTF, okay. So how do we go about that? For example, AR, uh, the same scenario as before, however, we introduce preemption. So, from 0 to 10, A is running, and then B arrives and C arrives. Right? So, at this point, the scheduler will decide new process arrive, B and C. How much time is needed for B to complete? How much? At this point, how much? 10. And then, uh, C arrives also. How much time uh, does C need to complete? Ten. Right? How about A? How much time still left for A? Ninety. Kasi kung 100 siya, minus ten, ninety. So ano mas maliit? Yung B sa C. So assuming na, syempre, si B and C kahit sabay sila, kahit may mga unang pa rin sa kanila, as we said a while ago. So you run first B. Right? So, hintay, so B, hintay mo matapos, you have 20. Right? Then, you run C, you have uh, uh, 30. Right? So, you now have the average term of time, 120 minus 0, 20 minus 10, and then 30 minus 10, and you now have the average term of time of oh, 50 seconds. You get the idea? So, by introducing preemption, we've reduced the 
average turnaround time for the SJF from for this set of jobs to 50 seconds. You get the idea? Okay. So uh, those uh, scheduling algorithms focus only on the performance, on the turnaround time, okay? But some operating systems would like to also consider yung tinatawag na response time, okay? So turnaround time, time to completion minus time to arrival. Yung response time naman has something to do with interactive systems. Ayaw mo naman magpindot ka ng, ng letter sa command prompt, tapos hihintayin mo ng 10 milliseconds or 10 seconds bago lumabas yung ano yung display okay kasi uh, yung previous scheduling algorithm yung ginamit natin so in the idea of response time uh, response time is the time from when the job arrives to the first time it is scheduled when you say it is scheduled it is play the first time it is placed in the CPU okay kasi initially kahit malagay na sila doon sa ready queue, pwede hindi pa sila malagay dito sa CPU. Okay? So pag nilagay mo na sila sa CPU, first time, yun yung uh, ibig sabihin ng schedule. Okay. SPCF and related disciplines are not particularly good for response time. Okay. So, shortest time to completion for is not good for response time. Okay. Bakit? Kasi halimbawa, uh, ito si A. Okay. So si A, Hihintayin mo siya, hihintayin mo din, magpumahaba yung remaining time niya. Okay. So, hindi mo nangyayari. Hihintayin mo rin siya. Okay. So, how can we build a scheduler that is sensitive to response time? Like desktop systems. Okay. So, dito na yun pasok yung round robin scheduling. So, the idea of round robin is time slicing. Okay. Uh, you run a job for a time slice and then switch to the next job uh, in the run queue. So, this is the run queue, the ready queue. Okay? So, what you do is to simply allocate uh, a certain time quantum okay, to this and then to each uh, process and then you let them complete that time quantum and then move on to the next uh, process. For example, ICSOS uses round robin for the scheduling. Okay? So you're going to have a chance to modify the scheduler of uh, ICS OS. Let's say move, improve, uh, implement a priority scheduler. Right. So how does it? How pan to ginagawa? Okay. So you have a time quantum. Uh, hanggang matapos siya. The length of a time slice must be a multiple of the timer interrupt period. So remember, the importance of timer, no? You have to set the uh, uh, kung kailan mo trigger yung interrupt timer interrupt handler kung kailan siya call so you have to set that. so it should be a multiple of the timer interrupt handler para hindi siya uh, mabitin okay so kung walang butal okay kasi the decision will be made I remember always remember the scheduling decision the scheduling decision will happen pag nag nandito sa pag nag-trigger yung timer interrupt. Okay? Pag nag-trigger yung timer interrupt, meron, kang in, uh, meron siyang interrupt handler doon, doon yung gagawin yung decision kung magiging schedule ba siya ng ibang, di ba sabi ko kanina, kung magiging schedule siya ng ibang process o babalik siya sa na-interrupt yung process. Okay? Always remember that. Okay? So RR is fair, but it performs poorly on metrics such as turnaround time. So this is uh, an example of uh, the round robin. Okay? So A, B, C arrive at the same time. Okay? They each wish uh, to run for five seconds. Okay? So uh, five, ten, fifteen. Okay? So the average response time, and I inform the response time. Uh, dito is uh, first run minus arrival. Okay. So first run zero. So five, uh, first run. Okay. Uh, first run D. Okay. First run C. So you have zero, zero plus five plus ten divided by D. So you have five seconds response time. Basically, obvious to man. Five seconds for this process. Right. Uh, now this one. Uh, this is SJF. 
the correct pronunciation. Huh? So round robin with a time slice of one second. Okay. So in a po. So five five with five sila gusto magrad in total. You can split it in, them into one second. So for example, a muna after one second. So one, two, three, four, five. So yeah. yung time slice niyo tira talo. Kaya yung idea. And if you perform the computation, okay, zero. Ito yung time na nag-first run siya, di ba? Si A, zero. That is zero. Si B, ano yung time na nag-first run siya? One, di ba? This is one. Si C, anong, anong time na nag-first run siya? Two. So, zero plus one plus two over three, that will be one second. So, ibig sabihin, yung average response time niya is one second. Get the idea? So, that's uh, what we mean by that. So, uh, if we use round robin, this is, this is the SJF, but the response time, the average response time is 5 seconds. Not, not good. However, if we use round robin, time slicing, and a time quantum of 1, right, then you have a shorter average uh, response time. Right? So, much interactive. Okay? Right? Now, the main variable for the main variable for Round robin is the scheduling quantum. Okay, the here the scheduling quantum is one second. Okay, one second. This is the scheduling quantum. Okay, one second. Now the choice of that value is critical. Okay, hindi ka pwedeng basta basta lang. Limbawa, uh, kung ang time quantum mo dito ay round robin ang ginamit mo. Tapos uh, ang time quantum mo ay five seconds. Ano mangyayari? Mag-deteriorate din siya into SJF. Okay? So, that is uh, critical. The selection of uh, the time quantum is critical. The shorter time slice, the better the response time. However, so sabihin natin one second yan. One second yan. No? Tapos, yung context, yung cost ng context switch natin, ay, let's say five seconds. Useless din yun. Yung pag-select mo ng time quantum na one second. Kasi ang mangyayari, one for the time quantum, u, bawa. Tapos kung halimbawa, yung context switch time mo ay 10 seconds, useless din yan. Okay? So, you have to be able to, you have to be able to quantify ano yung context switch time mo. At ano kayo, di ba ililipat lang naman yung registers? Di ba parang two point po lang naman yon, Di ba madali lang dapat yon. Tapos kanina, yung switch na function doon sa XV6, nagmove ka lang naman ng registers. Di ba ano lang yon? parang a few instructions lang yon. Bakit magko-consume ng, ano, ng, magko ng too much time yung context switch? Di ba? Kung ganun lang yon. Hindi, hindi obvious doon sa code na yun. Pero sa hardware level, level sa architecture, you have different caches, you have uh, different memory structures na ginagamit, and it requires actually uh, more time than just those instructions presented in the switch function in the XV6. Do you get the idea? Okay. So the choice of the... Uh, Time, quantum time Q is important. Uh, the number times, the number times slice. So what you do is to amortize the cost of switching. Amortize parang uh, i-allocate mo. Parang matang uh, ito, uh, sachap-chapin mo. Para hindi overall uh, makocover mo pa rin lahat. So deciding on the length of the time slice presents a trade-off to a system designer. Okay. Now let's move on to uh, the next part. Uh, last part of this chapter is incorporating I/O. So the assumption a while ago is that uh, no I/O is done. Everything is done on the CPU. All the processes A, B, C, they consume CPU time. Okay. If you're taking one, three, two, we have a formula for CPU time dependent on three var three parameters. But CPU time, okay, just uh, one measure. Okay. Now, if we incorporate I/O, okay, so let's say A and B need 50 milliseconds of CPU time each. 
A runs for 10 milliseconds and then issues an IO request. And each IO request, uh, 10 milliseconds. Then B simply uses the CPU for 15 milliseconds and performs no IO. Then the scheduler runs A first, then B after. So we have two processes. A requires uh, IO, B does not require IO on the CPU. How does the scheduler uh, schedule this? So if we don't incorporate I/O in the scheduling process, right? so pro so this is the CPU CPU burst. This is the I/O burst. Uh, usually, uh, processes dalawa dalawa yung ginagawa niya. Eh. Either nasa CPU siya or nasa I/O siya. Ang tawag dito ay CPU burst. Eto ay I/O burst. Right? Bawat nagdara na process combination of CPU burst, I.O. burst. So, this is CPU, this is I.O. So, say A, at time 10, nag-I.O. perform siya ng I.O. No, may loop siya halimbawa, ang nag-delete ng file. Okay? okay so, uh, process, F3, loop siya dito. Okay? So, sayang itong time na to, si Sayang itong time na to, na yung CPU walang ginagawa, naghihintay lang na matapos dito. So remember, this is a blocking, uh, blocking okay? The state of the process is blocking. Okay, you get the idea? Blocked. You see the first flow. So, a better approach basically is, habang naghihintay na matapos, singitan mo na ng B. Para, yung CPU laging may ginagawa. You get the idea? So that's basically what we mean by uh, uh, this scheduling algorithm, incorporating I/O. Okay, get the idea? So, and you see that dito ang haba bago matapos, 140 milliseconds pa dito at 100, uh, they have 100 uh, milliseconds. Tapos tayo pareho, right? Okay? So ang magyari lang is na paano may babalik dito? May paano babalik dito? Siyempre, mag-trigger ng interrupt yun. Di ba pinakita ko sa inyo last time yung dito, na kahit, kahit ready na, kahit ready na yung output, di ba? Uh, hindi mo na ililipat sa bagong process. Hihintayin mo na matapos sa libaw. Eh. Depending on the scheduling policy. Okay, you get the idea? So, when a job initiates I.O. request, uh, block for I.O. completion, schedule job for our CPU, Okay, an interrupt is raised, okay? And the, the OS moves the process from black back to the ready state. Okay, mabuti siya dito. Na-discuss ko na ito last time. Okay. Nag-drawing ako dito. Okay, so we'll stop here. Uh, so I hope you understand the concepts of uh, process scheduling. The next chapter will be a more advanced uh, discussion, more advanced uh,